All right, let's get to today's guest. We have two guests today, David Roberts and John Gilday. David Roberts holds an MPH from Johns Hopkins University, a master's in BME from UVA, and a bachelor's in EE and BME from Duke. David has more than 20 years of public health experience on three continents. In 2014, David co-founded the gut supplement Restore, now known as Ion. He's just a wealth of information. Joining David is John Gilday. John is a Johns Hopkins trained PhD with 60 scientific publications from over 20 NIH funded studies. He is an expert in cell culture and exosomes, performing all the science behind gut supplement Restore, now known as Ion. John was instrumental in the initial stabilization of something called sulforaphane, which you're going to learn all about today. I had to say, since the inception of the podcast, I've learned something from all of my guests, but this episode is going to blow your mind in the best of ways. It is fascinating. All right, let's get right to it. This is David Roberts and John Gilday's Art of Being Well. David and John, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're excited. People are going to be blown away. They're just going to, we're going to change their life one science fact at a time in this conversation. I don't think they're ready for this, but they better get ready. They better buckle up. So let's kind of set the stage with how did you, we're going to talk about sulforaphane, ways to support longevity, metabolism, detox pathways, so many different things, but- how did you get in this aspect of science, the, the research around sulforaphane specifically? Yeah, so my wife, uh, Mara, was diagnosed with cancer back in 2012, breast cancer. And so uh, she, we sort of did, she wanted to treat it uh, integratively, both uh, with some conventional, but all, a lot of alternative and natural treatments. And so I have background in the sciences started reading different things and saw about sulforaphane. And then actually we ended up growing her, uh, can't, we got a culture of her, our, our tumor, bit of her tumor and grew her cancer in our, our lab, John did. And we were able to put 60 different supplements on them to see what killed her specific type of cancer. And so sulforaphane, uh, this good molecule from broccoli, uh, was number three in killing her type of cancer. So I went out to buy it, ended up buying some, just uh, some bro run of the mill broccoli uh, supplements, and then realized that actually, even though it says it's sulforaphane glucosinolate, that doesn't mean that it's sulforaphane in the capsule. Because it really wasn't seeing, we weren't seeing the benefits. If you read about it in the literature, it's just amazing. And so we were kind of doing that for a few months, uh, and there's like, we're not really seeing anything. And then uh, come to find out she wasn't taking sulforaphane. She was taking the molecule that comes before sulforaphane. So at that point, we realized sulforaphane wasn't stable, because, and that's why it's not in the capsule. So we ended up growing like broccoli sprouts for like 10 families. And so we juice them every day, and, and we're getting the sulforaphane that way. And a couple years later, John, who was helping us out and giving us lots of good advice and, and suggestions from the science standpoint, was like, I think I stabilize sulforaphane. And we were like, what? And so we ended up testing it at third party and sure enough, he had stabilized it. And so uh, we were both with uh, another supplement company at the time, Ion. And so we ended up, we're just not gonna do anything with it, but Mara ended up raising the seed money to put it, uh, bring it to market. And unfortunately she ended up getting sick and dying. And then we ended up bringing it to market a few months later to kind of uh, in her honor, but also realizing her vision of people need this molecule and it's not out there. And, and so a lot of what we do is educate people like mm -hmm. a lot of the supplements out there. In fact, all but two don't have sulfur in the capsule. Wow. Thank you so much for that. And I'm so sorry for your loss as well. I mean, it's uh, to go through that. And, but like you said, it's in her honor. And so many people don't know about this. They're going to know so much more in, out of this conversation. So it's her legacy uh, lives on. And I have to say, and as a clinician who is a voracious reader of research and all these years, I've been saying it's sulforaphane. I'm the first thing I learned today is no, the academic science guys, 
say sulforaphane, so I'm going to start saying it the, the correct way from now on. But, I may be saying it wrong. Just say it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's tomato, tomato. I mean, it's like, who yeah. cares? We know, we know what it means. Yeah. We know what we mean. So let's not be too, uh, you know, elitist <laughs> here. Uh, we, we could be like the regular people. That the Let's define it first. I mean, now they just heard, whoa, what the heck? What, did, what can they do to cancer cells? What is sulforaphane? What, what is this compound? So, yeah, it was basically the molecule is from broccoli and it's derived from broccoli. So you have a head of broccoli, you start chewing it and it breaks the cell wall, which has an enzyme called morosinase. And it takes the precursor to sulforaphane called a glucoraphanin and together they make sulforaphane. And so it, the molecule was discovered in 1992 up at Johns Hopkins. And since then there've been over 2000 research papers on the mo molecule, but uh, there's actually a whole center at Hopkins called the Chemoprotective Institute that what they have done historically, is, and I don't think they do it now, but they grow broccoli sprouts because, they, again, they were unable to stabilize it. So they create these broccoli sprout, sprout beverages for the researchers. So you'll see most of the research papers out there have used their sprouts, the, their drink a broccoli sprout beverage uh, that they've measured for sulfuric content. But, you know, the benefits... I mean, that we, we typically highlight there are a lot of benefits, but uh, brain health, uh, we talk about detox, so it's, uh, it works in all three phases. It's the best uh, phase two detoxifier, inflammation, uh, antioxidant response system, and then also anti-aging. So those are some of the, some of the things that... It really yeah, and we're going to get very granular on all of those things of how it exactly works and the, the mechanisms involved. I'm curious, before we move on, you mentioned it being one of three different compounds that were the most effective for these cancerous cells. I'm curious, what were the other two? Do you guys remember? I remember. Do you remember? John? I think one of them was curcumin. Curcumin and vitamin C, the IV form. Yeah. Got it. So IV, vitamin C, curcumin, and sulforaphane. So let's talk about the stabilization, John. Why is that so important? How does somebody know if they're like reading a label on a supplement form, it, 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 how, if it's stabilized or not? And when you're getting in food form, how much of it's bioavailable? How much of it's stabilized in eating broccoli sprouts, for example? Yeah, so the standard for sure out there is to eat the broccoli sprouts. In the case of uh, the production that they do for research, is they they make a, a liquid version of it and then they test for sulforaphane in it and then they deep freeze it and so they have it stabilized by putting it in a minus 80 freezer which most people don't have access to and so those those products that they gave out to do the research is what what is used out there but in the case of trying to make it stable the only way to to really test it is to like what we did was make it and then store it at different temperatures and then over time uh, sample it. And so we have subsequently showed that, you know, at first it was, we knew it was stable, but not how, how stable. We've gone out multiple years now. And so we know that it's, it's very stable. So the critical pieces there are, you know, keeping it dry, but that's probably as, as far as they want me to talk about the, the actual mechanism of stability. <laughs> so if yeah. you if you open the bottle and and then uh, close it and then store it, we've done that out to a year and it's stable out to a year. And if you go on Amazon, you'll see there are products that says stable that say stabilized sulforaphane in the titles, things like that. Then you look at the back of the uh, label and it says sulforaphane glucosinolate or uh, glucoraphanin and glucoraphanin. People, the, all the other most of the other supplements have that because it's stable. Yeah. Got it. But it doesn't give you the benefits. Got it. So let's kind of really dial in into longevity, health span, anti-aging. A lot of the listeners really want to know different ways they can optimize it. They want to know the latest science on this space of, of health span and longevity. And I know one of the uh, avenues in which this research is exploring sulforaphane or sulforaphane, tomato, tomato, uh, what it can do uh, is one of the mechanisms is autophagy. And most of the listeners know what autophagy is, but if you could touch on it for maybe people that are newer to the conversation and how sulforaphane can really, what's sulforaphane's role in in the induction of autophagy? 
The good framework for that is that my background is genetics. So embedded in in any genome is a, a, a large number of slight mutations called SNPs. And so those are those are often just small changes in amino acids and proteins that you don't normally see the phenotype from. But as you age and as you damage these proteins, they tend to want to not fold properly. So the, the, the actual activity of proteins or the, the, you know, the function of those proteins get damaged over time. And so one of the ways that you turn over proteins is proteostasis. So it's how you get rid of proteins that are under functioning. And so the way your body does that is by autophagy. So if you have an accumulation of misfolded proteins by, you know, uh, stress or mutation or SNPs or, you know, any of the, the ways that you know how you damage proteins, they'll accumulate and that cell then starts functioning suboptimally. And so autophagy is the protein component of that. Mitophagy is the mitochondrial component of that. And there's specific signaling uh, that goes on to turn that on and get rid of the misfolded proteins. And so that's why, especially as we age, it would be very good to stimulate autophagy to, to kind of clear out those misfolded proteins. Got it. So, so forfins, it would be accurate to say then it's, it's increasing the body's ability to, to support autophagy pathways, correct? Yep. Got it. So what does that mean on a practical level? It is by supporting the way that I think of autophagy, if you break that word down, autophagy, self-eating, it's all our good cells gobbling up all the dysfunctional cells. I know that's very elementary and reductive, but is that a good description for the layperson out there? Yeah, I think it is. I think in the case that you're talking about is dead cells being cleared. So a lot of that, that kind of moves into a, a, a different topic, which is synolysis. So getting rid of senescence cells. Yes. Also an extremely good inducer of, of senescence. But the, uh, the autophagy, at least in, in my mind, is happening within a single cell. So it's the, it's the mechanism within a cell that is consuming the misfolded proteins. Got it. So does the, is there a correlation between autophagy pathways and sort of the senolytic activity, or can one happen without the other? Are, are they part of the larger larger goal here? Yeah, they are related for sure. I mean, a good example of it, just because we were talking about cancer earlier, is that you know, if, if you go through a treatment and you are treated with the, the classic uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, it's now known that there you have from then on a, a much higher number of senescent cells in your body. And, and so those senescent cells are ones that do not proliferate anymore. So they're kind of stuck in this stasis where it's not proliferating anymore. So it's not rebuilding the tissue. And then those cells also tend to have a secretory phenotype where they're secreting cytokines. So that's a really important component of aging right now is that these inflammatory molecules, when you have senescent cells, is creating this auto, this inflammatory state that's hard to, it's very hard to reverse unless you can stimulate the clearing of those cells and decrease that inflammatory mechanism. Got it. And another interesting pathway that's being explored in the research with sulforaphane is histone deacetylase inhibition. So that specifically could be really beneficial for cancer, right? I mean, and, and maybe can we explain that? Because autophagy, I feel, is a little bit more sexy in, in the wellness space, but histone deacetylase inhibition is newer. Maybe many people don't know about it. Can you explain that? Do you want to do a, a high view of break, that? Break it down I... for us, David. Come on. The goal of this right now is to make histone deacetylase inhibition as sexy as autophagy right now for all the biohackers out there. I'll let, I'll, big, I'll big let John jump in and then I'll, I'll make it sexy. <laughs> uh, so I'll just say kind of how I understand it. So uh, histone acetylation is a, a feature of how DNA is wrapped up into generally open states of transcription or closed states of transcription. So it's kind of one of the mechanisms that epigenetics happens is I actually did my PhD on this. So if I go too granular, slow me down. No, but, get as granular as you want to get. That's great. So as you as you're developing... You have regions of your chromosomes that are open that allow transcription factors to go in there and turn on genes. And those are called euchromatins. So they're open configuration. And then there's a whole set of genes that 
that do that during development. And then uh, an opposing set of genes that are to close off sections of your genome and make them inaccessible. So those are the, the two states, uh, heterochromatin and euchromatin, so it's open and closed states. And then as you're, as you're aging, what's happening is that every time you get a, a DNA strand break, the mechanisms that allow you to remember the on and off state of your genes gets distracted. This is a core a component of those chromatin regulating genes get distracted to go fix that DNA stand break before you go on and continue developing. And so it makes you forget your state of on and off genes. And so that's done through histone deacetylation, acetylation, and you know, it's one of the layers of it. And so in general, uh, they're packaged tight in one in one situation, histone deacetylase will allow access to to genes so that you can you know regulate genes within. So we're talking about large numbers of genes and the the, the slow process of development and the slow process of aging, you can access those mechanisms. Got it. David, any thoughts on this? Well yeah, I, I think just that I mean that's very specific, but I think as we're talking about different different things within aging, and John says this all the time and I'm and uh, it's a lot of it, it the, the larger picture is, I think everything we've talked about is driven by inflammation. So in essence, like he was talking about with radiation and chemotherapy and just all, you know, the autophagy, the need to induce autophagy, those cells uh, probably went down because of inflammation. And so, you know, that's, that's uh, the beauty of sulfurofen is you know, one of the one of the main steps is it, it helps with inflammation, and it mm -hmm. does these other things too. So it's like one, two, it, it's coming at anti aging mm -hmm. from a lot of different angles. Yeah, absolutely. And another one, a part of that, you, like you said, the the senensis, uh, senensis, and the autophagy and these other pathways, these longevity pathways. One of them is the antioxidant response system and how it really induces over 200 different genes. Like you said, we, we can narrow down on like the really interesting ones that we understanding the, the pathway or someone, you know, just doing their, their thesis on this pathway, but it's doing lots of different things for our body that we're probably just only beginning to understand. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we both do. But what, I mean, one of the most exciting things about if you think about like we we're talk, just talking about vitamin C, if you yeah. think of vitamin C, you know, it's an antioxidant. One vitamin C molecule can cancel out one pro-oxidant. Sulfurifen is almost uh, uh, like a master antioxidant in the sense that it induces what you said, the antioxidant response system, which are genes that then start pumping out over 200 different type of antioxidants. And what's more is that it turns it on for a uh, one dose, turns it on for 72 hours. And so it just keeps going and going, and going. I was camping with my son in um, in Colorado this past summer, and for some reason, this is the first time it's happened. But I uh, brought some broccoli because we were doing long hikes, and I was like, I definitely I'm going to need it for the for these old bones. And but it oxidized, and so actually it was moist. And it happened to be uh, moist there that at that time, rainy, and it was no good. And so a day went by two days went by, three days went by. And then by the fourth day, I was definitely noticing like, okay, I'm, I'm definitely feeling it. And that's, that's the, you know, the, the at that time, you know, the, those, the antioxidant response system and that induction had worn off. Mm. Fascinating. And I, I'm aware of the research around Sulforfin's ability to mo modulate mi our microbiome's age, which I find fascinating, which I don't think a lot of people know about. But how, what's the connection there? How do we find out how old our microbiome is and really support not our, our own health span, but the health span of our microbiome, which is intimately connected to our own? Yeah, I think the, the, the connection to the microbiome is really interesting. Probably an audience like yours that's up on the on the research will know that a lot of the brain related issues that people are having right now, it's turning out each one of them is starting in the gut. And mm -hmm. so the inflammation and, and the microbiome and how it's functioning or dysfunctioning is being transmitted backwards up through your your neurons back into your brain. 
So the, that's actually the mechanism is with through misfolded proteins. So the way that the kind of seminal, seminal study on, on sulforaphane for the microbiome was that you just measure what is the microbiome of a young person and what is the microbiome of an old person. And then to take sulforaphane and then look at the change uh, in, in, in the short term. And it was very clear that a large number of the microbiome was switching back towards a younger profile. And that's important because it's really hard to go in there with a single bacteria and figure out pathways. Yeah. But there are ways to, to, to show general features of it as being pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, things like that. But in this case, it was just looked younger. And so the, the aspects of which bacteria go up and down is kind of in the minutia. But the, but the overall idea that the, that the microbiome is more useful was very striking. And I think a lot of people didn't, didn't realize that sulforaphane had that activity until that paper. But um, it's pretty easy to see how it could act in that area because we've shown uh, sulforaphane drops your blood sugar levels. Quick. It'll make you go into ketosis more quickly. So you get into uh, secreting butyrate, you know, as you as your blood sugar is lower over over time. And of course, your microbiome interface with both sugar and butyrate is is a kind of very central feature of how your microbiome functions or or how you can tell whether it's 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 functioning well. Mm. In fact, one of the that one of the papers that might be the one that you're talking about, they actually did find that, as John was saying, you know, if they had they had a control of older, I think this this paper I'm thinking about was mice that that didn't have sulforaphane, old, old mice that did, younger mice that didn't, younger mice that did have sulforaphane, and the young both sets of the young mice and the old mice uh, that had sulforaphane had a bacteria that actually is known to produce fatty acids, which would be important for the or short change, short change fatty acids, which would be important for the butyrate production. Butyrate, yeah. Yeah. And isn't it fascinating? I mean, kind of touching on what you both are saying is that as time goes on and we understand these underlying mechanisms of how such and such molecule, how can such and such compound impact? How does it, we know it's beneficial, but how? Well, it turns out so much of it, the, the causal underlying mechanism is that how it's modulating our microbiome. It's so how many examples can we think of over the past 10, 15 years that that's the case? It's really the microbiome's implication and how it's benefiting many other systems of the body, like our skin or our hair or our mood or our energy levels or inflammation levels. Uh, it's so fascinating, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the transfer of bacteria for you know increasing longevity, you know, young bacteria into older and and the vice versa. So it's, it's let's very... talk about that. I because I, I I know people's ears are ringing right now. What what do you what goes on there? What about the transfer of bacteria that we should know about? Yeah. So in one area of research that I think is very very interesting, the general idea is what you're switching things from old and young. Mm -hmm. And just to summarize, a lot of a lot of work is you know a big component of is is the actual ratio of bacteria in your microbiome. So if you do a fecal transplant, you can transplant a lot of, especially the sugar metabolism that's going on in a young, a young person that, you know, they just very infrequently have problems with, with sugar metabolism. That's one of them. And then the other component that I'm also interested in is what are the things that are swimming around in your plasma that are, that are aging you and sort of a summary of that kind of world where you, you join the circulatory systems together of old and young mice is that surprisingly, it isn't that the factors from the young mouse are de-aging the old. It's that it's the dilution of factors that are keeping you old in the older mice. So all you mm. have to do is dilute these factors that are keeping you locked into the aging program. And so that seems a lot more able to, you're able to overcome that idea a lot better than, you know, if you think, oh, I'm just missing these, all these factors that are keeping me young. So things like, you know, when you're doing exercise and, and all these things that can dramatically change, ch change, you know, systems of your microbiome and, and system of your, of your blood serum content, you know, it seems much more uh, less of a hurdle than, you know, I damaged 40% of my genome and need to, you know, refold and get rid of all those proteins. So 
Absolutely. So, and we, we're, we're down, we're talking about the second brain, the gut, right? 95% of serotonin's made there, 50% of dopamine's made there. And it's you no know, one, it, I think physically, I think even resembles the brain, your intestines. So let's go from the second brain to the brain and the connection between sulforaphane and the induction of BDNF. Can we define BDNF and why we want to make sure we are supporting these pathways? Yeah, and, and that, absolutely. And before we make that jump, I just I'd love for John to share some of his research on how sulforaphane really helps with uh, the gut in, in terms of tight junctions. And, oh, and with uh, leaky gut syndrome. Yeah, that would be great. And we could, I'm sure, I don't know if data is out there now, but we know the connection between leaky gut syndrome and what they call leaky brain syndrome, you know, increased blood brain barrier permeability, which zonulin really uh, is implicated in both leaky gut and leaky brain. So it's a good segue uh, between both. So what's what's going on there between BDNF and then also intestinal permeability would be great. Yeah. So just to separate kind of big areas or, or, or fields of research, the one I think is is really interesting to focus in on in it with sulforaphane. Sulforaphane activates a pathway called NRF2. And NRF2 is is you can in the intestine, you can you can basically say it is the master regulator of tight junctions. And so when you induce that, you tighten the tight junctions and you're going to get less just in food material passing through the through the, the lining of the intestines and being introduced to your uh, gut associated lymphoid system. So which is the beginning of a lot of the trouble with your immune system. Right. So uh, triggering autoimmune autoimmune issues and many different inflammatory problems. Yeah. And and the allergies and all that kind of stuff. Right. Right. stuff too. But what's unique to sulforaphane, I think I haven't seen in other supplements, is that it also repa- repairs uh, gap junctions. So that being a unique thing to sulforaphane, it was very interesting to me because uh, I set up the test in order to measure these gap junctions. So it might be a new term for a lot of people is when a tissue is acting like a tissue, they have these little pipes that are that go in between the cells. And they share the content of the cytoplasm with each other. So it actually is connected. So your cells in an organ are passing information between them and they can act like an organ. They'll respond Mm -hmm. as an organ. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a really important feature of how you become cancerous is you lose the connection to the tissue that you're around. And so that's the first step in metastasis also. But so making that tissue act like a tissue is a really big feature of sulforaphane and it actually repairs damage to your intestines and repairs your gap junctions. Wow. Yeah. And one and one of the ways we looked at that and John looked at that was through putting glyphosate, which is the active ingredient roundup, on uh, on cells. And so and basically at that point with NRF2 specifically, he saw uh NRF2 drop 30%, I believe. Is that right? And, you know, if you think about, if you think about it, NRF2 is responsible for, for phase two detox, you know, 30% drop is, is massive. massive. And so yeah. this glyphosate is making, and NRF2 works in every cell of your body. So all of a sudden, every toxin that you're exposed to, once you have that glyphosate insult, it's accumulating that much more toxic, right? Yeah. Because you can't, you can't get it out. And so what John showed was basically what with one dose of sulforaphane, you can get that NRF2 back back up to normal. And that, like you were saying, impacts, you know, your tight junction integrity. Yeah. I have to say on a clinical level, when I'm looking at labs, the amount of, of these pesticides and herbicides, Roundup, glyphosate, other environmental toxins, it is high in so many people and they don't even know it. They, they don't, they think, you know, it's some abstract thing that they know is not good, you know, toxins, quote unquote, that they hear people in wellness talk about so much, but it's in people's systems. So, so to be supporting the NRF2 pathways and these other, you know, methylation pathways is essential for, I mean, these toxins trigger chronic diseases, autoimmune problems. And that's one of the reasons why we see such an epidemic rise of autoimmune conditions. So I just want to bring it home to people's real life. This is important for your your life, your family's life. So it's improving intestinal permeability. It's, it's, it's healing leaky gut syndrome, for lack of better 
or improving the intestinal lining integrity, maybe is a better way of putting it. What's it doing for the brain with BDNF? I'm fascinated about this. And maybe define BDNF if we can. Sure. I would I would I would say the the first thing is that, you know, we were talking about the connection to microbiome and sugar. And so many of those, you know, that that combination of making butyrate and then also decreasing the amount of sugar is is a scenario that is amenable to brain health in general. And and so that switch of lowering sugar and increasing butyrate in general is inflammation in your brain. But besides that mechanism is that sulforaphane itself is able to travel through the whole body. It doesn't have a problem with bioavailability. So it makes it to your brain directly. It's it's there. And so that's a, a really unique aspect of sulforaphane because many supplements are not able to penetrate that blood brain barrier. Mm-hmm. And so it's making it to your brain. And so uh, the connection to BDNF is interesting because BDNF in, in, in general, I would say that the big induction of it is butyrate as well as fasting. So that's the AMP kinase system. And so induction of BDNF is just something that's known to be done through sulforaphane. And the reason that that is is so important is that brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a factor that is driving neuroplasticity. So your ability for your brain to accommodate change like uh, maybe a good way to think about that is somebody that was sighted and then loses their sight. That brain that you have used your whole life to, to develop the ability to, to see, to, to process visual information, when that's lost, your brain will actually start using that brain area in order for hearing, for taste, for other uses. And that's why in, in people that are blind, they often have dramatically enhanced senses in other par- parts of their ability, their sensing ability. And so that would be neuroplasticity, a good example of neuroplasticity, mm-hmm. even though you're an adult or, or you know, already finished developing. So neuroplasticity is, is something that we all want to be able to do and is, is, is the reason why you want to keep stimulating your brain as you're, as you're aging, you know, introduce it to new subjects, make make yourself mass massinate passionate <laughs> on chew on ideas for Masticate. a while. <laughs> Masticate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not, hey, a, not a again, English major. I know, exactly. We're like we're all not English majors. We're just say things. We know we know what we're talking about. Just believe us. <laughs> You're able to to make your brain be adaptable to current yes. time. So you want to be able to change. Yeah. So, and what I mean one of our partners uh, Martin Katz who helped uh, bring the sulforaphane product to the market too. Uh, he's an MD uh, He in his clinic, you know, he just, he, we we're talking about this. And he's like, I see so many people with uh, memory loss, with issue, you know, memory issues, but then also, you know, we're post COVID or even within COVID-19, a lot of mood issues. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so that, that are brain related, that are sleep related too. And that the need for BDNF, BDNF is huge. And, and a lot of people will email us and say, how do I know, how do I know that broccoli is working and does the different things that you say it does? And so I'll often email them back and I'm like, how have you had any vivid dreams lately since you've started taking it? And uh, not, it's not everybody, it's about a quarter of the people will email back and be like, oh my gosh. I've been wondering what that is. That's BDNF. And so that's the neuroplasticity element that John was talking about. That is at the BDNF really is at the center of brain health. And so with so many brain, you know, memory issues and, and mood issues around today, specifically having something that induces BDNF is gold. It's a gold mine. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not saying don't fast. We're not saying don't exercise, which also induces BDNF. You should do those too, but this is another, yet another tool as well. Yeah, I love that. So it's your brain-derived neurotropic factors, your body's ability to make new neurons. Like you said, neuroplasticity, people. You don't, the old science, the old idea that like basically once your brain is, like neurons are dead, there's nothing going going back. Yeah. The new science is quite the opposite. Your body, yeah. your brain is able to regenerate and this is a way to do that. And you touched on through the conversation, you know, different ways to support autophagy or support butyrate. And it goes, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll put, pose the question to you, what are some other of your favorite ways 
to support longevity, like the top ones? I'm assuming it's fasting on the list and maybe maybe give us three uh, other ways that are complementary to these pathways that sulforaphane supports. Don't take all that. Don't take all the answers, John. Just, just three, please. Well, yeah, just stick, in, stick to three, John. Come on. Start with the one. So a really fun topic for me is hormetic stress. So, you know, why is why is exercise so good for you? One of the things it does is induce these heat shot factors. And so similar to autophagy, there's another pathway that you can refold proteins, and that's through heat shot uh, factors. And so they also refold proteins. And so that's pretty easy to see that when you're, you know, really extreme exercising, you're overheating and you're you're stimulating this this heat shock response. Another one is is sauna. So sauna very similar to exercise. It's actually surprising how similar it is to exercise. Yeah. Um, if you go in and you know measure your heart rate and measure your breathing and your temperature, that's actually a good measure of how long you should stay in the sauna. You know, stay in long enough that your heart rate starts race, you know, going on. Mm-hmm. Stay in long enough until, you know, your your actual core temperature rises. And so those are two that I think are really amenable even to people that may may not be able to to exercise mm-hmm. as thoroughly enough to to raise your temperature. You can get started with with sauna and also sulforaphane induces a, a HSP. So it's just one of those exactly. topics that I really, I really think is, is a, is is one that anyone has access to. Of right. course, if you talk to your doctor. Yeah, <laughs> to your yeah doctor. The, the disclaimer. Not the disclaimer. The the yeah, MVP. right. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I'd say, of course, you know, John took exercise. So of course, I mean, one of the ones that I think we both do is uh, resveratrol. So that works uh, with in the cert. Uh, the CERT uh, area and uh, David Sinclair's research is very compelling. There's also some uh, counter research, but which I don't think we agree with. I don't think. Anyway, but yeah, I'd say anti-aging, uh, resveratrol, uh, it's the molecule in red wine responsible for the uh, French paradox. At least they think, they originally thought maybe there's research that shows maybe not, but where French people eat fatty foods but and drink lots of wine but are still pretty healthy uh, cardiovascularly. And then I'm just thinking, I mean, a lot of a lot of the things, you know, because we come from a cancer background with my wife's cancer, if, if we're kind of pushing against cancer, you are kind of by definition pushing, again, you know, towards anti-aging. And so... If you think about what stimulates your Krebs cycle, so I, I'll do PQQ, I'll do Biquinol, so the reduced yeah. of CoQ10. Um, yeah. Those are some ways. We have a, a, a berberine product that we like a lot. Mm. Um, and so berberine is infamously poor at getting into your, or getting across your blood barrier. It's very, it's one of the fat solubles that's not bioavailable. And so we get it, we basically have a technology to get across the, the barrier. And so what that does is it can throw you into ketosis in four hours. Wow. Um, if you're fasting. And so that's uh, the whole idea of ketosis and, and it is, is another favorite, but really fasting. And right now, like I'm doing the Prolon fast, do a little, ad. we don't sell it. We just buy it, Prolon. Um, <laughs> well, well customer, yeah. yeah. And so, the, it, you know, basically it's it's the the easy way to do a fast. You get the stem cell proliferation benefits with still having some calories of two boys and they will run me ragged if I don't have <laughs> a few calories. And then I'll, you get the hangry and like, ah. And they're like, <laughs> yell at me. Why did you yell at me? I'm, I'm hangry. So anyway, it helps with that. But I, I'd say, you know, really sleep. Sleep is so central to just rejuvenating yourself. And, and you know, it goes back to, I mean, last night I just got four hours of deep sleep. I took two broccolites and two of our berberites. And it's just, it's just so great magnesium. It's so great for throwing you into deep sleep. I love that. It, these are all really good tips. And you mentioned even earlier the sulforaphane being for somebody that's having difficulty getting into ketosis. Maybe they're experimenting with the ketogenic diet. They're wanting to support 
longevity health span or they have an inflammatory problem or a metabolic issue, they're trying to lose weight, whatever reason they're doing it. Many people have trouble getting in ketosis. So you just, a lot of the things you just mentioned here, so forfin, the berberine, optimizing sleep, fasting, all of these things can really help enhance these pro, not only pro longevity pathways, but these fat burning f- keto, ketogenic pathways as well. Yeah. And I, I would just say, you know, having, we've done a, a decent amount, just, you know, it's not, it's not easy, but if you stay the course, you know, and you get what's called keto adapted, so you can actually use your ketones, it's a game changer. So, and that can take weeks to months. Yeah. Yeah. But once you are, it's really, you know, you can cycle in and out. And then once you cycle, you know, cycle out of ketosis, eat carbs, you can cycle back in and still be able to burn those ketones. Yeah, for sure. And that I think from a long term standpoint, that cyclical ketogenic diet is a great idea for most people to be supporting longevity and so many other things in the body. So let's talk about just day to day. How do we get sulforaphane in the diet? How If we're going to start with food, yeah. what is how much broccoli sprouts are we downing? <laughs> like how much should we be getting with, with our meals? Yeah, that's, and, a, and, and that's a, may, maybe some other foods too, not just broccoli sprouts. It's a great, it's a great question, Will, because you know, it, it, the, the broccoli sprout is sort of the king, right? It's the one that people go to. It's a superfood. My boys grow microgreens. They grow lots of bro- bro- broccoli microgreens and sell them to people. People love them. We grew them in the sprout version for years and we would we would juice about two to three ounces and throw some carrot in there throw some ginger in there throw some lemon in there and and have a really good juice that's palatable because if you're just doing a broccoli sprout shot that's not sustainable it's awful you know it tastes nasty but if you throw some lemon in there right john (laughs) if you throw some lemon in there all of a sudden that that citrus cuts it but two to three ounces you know and and the thing is, uh, the two there are two things. Like, we we sell seeds because uh, we know pe- not everybody wants to buy a capsule, not everybody wants to spend the money to that or can. But not all seeds are created equal. We actually bought 2019. We tested. We we're looking for seeds, sources of organic broccoli seeds, and we we're just finding some funny results with our test internal testing. It's come to find out uh, we had bought seven brands of organic seed off Amazon, six of the seven did not have the ability to make sulforaphan. She was like, dude, what's going on there? You know, and so we retested about six months later, nine different uh, brands. At that point, I think eight of the nine did produce sulforaphan, which is great. But it's just like, it all of a sudden raises this issue of like, well, why didn't, why, like, what's going on? Like, why didn't, so we offer seeds that we know we test half a pound can make about 400 microgram or milligrams of sulforaphan. It's just given. And so people want to buy, we're fine with that. You know, we don't make a ton of money off that if any, because, but, but it's a service and we all say, Hey, throw some radish in there too. Radish has, is a good source of the, that enzyme morosinase. But I mean, really, if you think about it, if, have you grown microgreens before or sprouts? No, I've bought them before, but I've never taken the leap yet. It is, it is, it can get a little dicey, especially during the summer months <laughs> where you get, you know, all of a sudden you have like a crop that you're counting on that has mold all through it. You have to toss mm. it. And yeah. so, but, and then, and then like I grew, we were, as we were doing it, we had at the time two young children. And if you travel, you miss a, you miss a crop. It's really difficult. And so having uh, a capsule, sulforaphane in the capsule that you know you can trust is just, it's just, uh, even if you're growing it, you may want to have that back as a backup. Yeah, and if you're, if you're pretty gutsy, we sell the liquid also. So that's a lot more economical. You can mix it with papaya, mango juice covers it pretty well. And so you can experiment to see how you can make that palatable. But we had a lot of fun at conferences just putting the liquid out and having people taste it. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely. Uh, we'll see how wellnessy are you by like your face whenever you take the shot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, level of toughness. Yeah. So how are we? How many servings? We're getting it from our foods. 
w- how above and beyond the food just to make sure we're getting the therapeutic dose uh, throughout the day. I've been taking two capsules of broccoli every day. Uh, is that enough? Should I be titrating it higher than that? What, what's the science show? Yeah, so that was one of the tests that I developed was how to actually measure NRF2 in a person. And so with just two two pills, I measured the NRF2 induction in buccal cells. They're the cells that lining are lining your mouth. And so I got the, the equivalent of five micromole of pure sulforaphane when I took the cells and, and incubated them outside of the body. And so the same cells when I took two pills and measured it within the body was five micromole. And so the only thing to compare that to really is in humans is there's a, a fantastic study done by Johns Hopkins with ladies who were having breast reduction. So they take four ounces of broccoli sprouts. And then during the breast reduction, they measured the amount of sulforaphane that was in the breast tissue. And that was two micromole. And then in a, a paper that is associated with that, they showed that two micromole of sulforaphane could actually block development of breast cancer in an in vitro organoid-like system, so pretty close to, to, to in vivo. And so most of the studies, when they're looking at sulforaphane and broccoli sprouts, they'll, they're able to measure two micromole. We're able to get five micromole equivalents because we're, we're adding, we're not just stabilizing sulforaphane and broccoli. There's a bunch of isothiocyanates that are in there that are also stabilized. And then we add a, in our Broccoli plus. We're also adding phenethyl phenethyl isothiocyanate. So that's the 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 one that's famous from watercress. Got it. Works in, synergistically with sulforaphane. So that's sort of our, our premier product is that we're getting just from uh, a dose that you uh, take from the recommended dose from the bottle. You're actually getting therapeutic amounts of sulforaphane. Perfect. Wow, that's great. I, 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 I love the product so much. And as I'm always saying on the podcast, if someone's on the podcast as a guest, it's because I take it myself, I recommend it to patients or both. And this is definitely a both for sure. So let's, can we go back to the, some of the other, other foods maybe people can incorporate in their day? Mention, obviously broccoli sprout is the highest content so forth. And watercress, I know you mentioned that. Thanks for highlighting that. Are there other, you mentioned radishes, any other super high nutrient dense foods here in this category of supporting these pathways? What I'm famous for saying is you don't stop eating your broccoli because adult broccoli has compounds that are not in our, in our, in our pill. So uh, DIM and I3C are two components that are much higher in adult broccoli. So they are shown in many different places to work synergistically with sulforaphane. So okay. um, your adult broccoli also. And then our other famous uh, uh, ones that I think are, are we've shown synergy with. So parsley, uh, uh, chamomile tea. Uh, so we can get into the actual molecules of those, but uh, turmeric is also uh, shown to be synergistic with curcumin. Them. And then berberine. And so that's kind of our, if, if you looked at our, our next five years, the, the supplements that we're putting out are ones that are synergistic with sulforaphane. And so I would say those are, those are big ones for me is uh, parsley, you can juice it or you can put it on food, you know, more than usual. Chamomile tea at night, that's apigenin, big, big fans of apigenin. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are kind of big ones for me. Love that. David, any other thoughts? Uh, Yeah. I mean, John, John covered quite a bit there, you know, Nutrient density is something we talk a lot, a lot about, and John talks a lot about Bruce Ames with the micronutrient deficiency causing aging. And so, you know, uh, raw, an egg, a farm-raised organic egg, beef liver, a beef, any organ meat is, is good for micronutrients. But I think, I mean, you know, just as, as so, some thoughts to kind of that I've had as we're talking is, that, you know, it, we're in a, and you see this probably we're the the first generation i believe is the re, re, research shows uh is, is that we may not live as long or longer than the previous generation and that's mm-hmm. like you know that's because toxic burden toxins and impacting your brain cells 
you know, organs, all sorts of things, gut, the whole glyphosate burden, and that's insidious and everything. And so having tools to really push back Mm -hmm. uh, against those toxins and and also support, you know, anti-aging, it's super important. Yeah, without a doubt. Man, this has been a rich conversation. Before we go, you all know that the podcast is called The Art of Being Well. I want to pick your brains about a few other, th- few other things that we call your art of being well. This is David and John's art of being well. I want to pick your brain about different things within wellness. The first question is, we talked about some bad tasting things right now, some you know shots of, of, of sulforaphane. But what is a healthy food that we haven't talked about so far that is the worst tasting healthy food that you still have it because it's just so, has so much exciting science around its health benefits. I just said it the other day at lab meeting was like, I drink cod liver oil every morning. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good answer. So I, I'm routine about that. I'm kind of dogmatic about it with my family. They hate, <laughs> literally hate me for it. And, uh, but just as sort of a, a, a good readout of how things well went is, um, both my girls are graduated now, but kindergarten through 12th grade, they only missed uh, one day of school between kindergarten and, That's and graduating. That's great. So there, I mean, there's, tell, tell people there's great source of fat, soluble vitamins, omegas, like what, why, why should people be looking at cod liver oil? Yeah. So the, the omega-3 fatty acid profile, you know, that combined with trying to reduce your uh, omega-6 fatty acids is just the number one, two punch when I talk to anybody of trying to decrease inflammation, you know, that, that ratio has been, been proven for eternity. I mean, cod liver oil was the first study ever done on humans to show increased longevity in 1930s. So, wow, um, I didn't know that. Very cool. Is there any brand that you like specifically with cod liver oil? I know people have their favorites here. Yeah, I, I, I've switched around all different brands and things, and and I will often take one that I think is the most palatable. With I, I think is Carlson's, okay. and then I will actually put back some of the supplements uh, that are that are supposed to be in there. So I'll I'll add back to try and make a more universal fat soluble system. So I'll add back gamma topotrienols into it, and I'll add vitamin K two back into it, and I'll add a little bit more vitamin A. And then I do put more vitamin D into that one. So um, that's kind of my go-to is to, to fortify one that actually tastes really good. I love it. You've biohacked cod liver oil. <laughs> you just made your own. Uh, I love it. How about you, David? Well, I was, I was just, I was worried I wouldn't be able to beat John's nastiness as far as cod, cod liver oil. But <laughs> so one that I, I, I don't do every day. In fact, uh, well, but it is definitely nastier to the taste than cod liver oil is liquid ketones. Oh, for sure. I know what you're talking about. It is like a cleaning product, (laughs) something you would put in a car, (laughs) but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and so, you know, we were doing it, we were doing that back in the, you know, 2014, 2015, way before the keto had taken off. But like there was, at that point, there was the research that thought maybe that wasn't good. And so we stopped, but I think there's research that's showing that is actually better now, right, John? Yeah, yeah, it lowers your blood sugar. Yeah, and so that's. But I think this isn't as this isn't as bad as cod liver oil, but it's it's still pretty bad. It's it's called uh, the Budwig diet. So you take flaxseed oil and you blend it with cottage cheese, and so <laughs> it actually actually uh, your it makes makes the, the flaxseed oil bioavailable. And so Joanna Budwig, who John introduced me to, who is a lady. And from Germany in the 30s, who could have won the Nobel Prize had she not been a female, potentially, and really helped a lot of cancer patients. So anyway, it, it increases your omegas, omega right. threes. Hands down, guys. I've asked a lot of people that question. You guys gave the best answers, but I oh, wouldn't have you. expected anything less. It was so fresh and innovative. What's the weirdest wellness thing that you've done? And I think you both being science-minded people, what, <laughs> it's relative, I know, weird, but you've probably done a lot of n one experiments here. So what's the weirdest thing you've done for your wellness that you're willing to admit on a podcast? I would say it, what just jumps to mind was after testing porphine on cells, I became convinced that our version of, of sulforaphane was safe. 
And I couldn't say that for other versions that I was that I was testing. And so to to prove that, we all sat around the production facility and ate the equivalent of a brick of of sulforaphane. So like the equivalent of maybe a hundred pills more or more. <laughs> You were ODing, but not ODing on sulforaphane. That's funny. How did you feel? Did you start to levitate? <laughs> if, you, if, you do, if you do that, you will always remember what your brain feels like with no inflammation. Right. And wow. it is very, very different. Like if, if someone has gotten into very deep ketosis, it's very similar to yeah. that. Like Got it. Makes sense. More brighter than normal. Yeah. If you're not used to it, it would be just a little bit disturbing, but. How about yeah. you, David? <laughs> Weir- weirdness, what weirdest wellness so, yeah. thing that you've done? I'll just I'll just go for it. So basically, I'm in Cabo. It's two days. <laughs> As all good Easter. stories begin, I'm in Cabo. <laughs> two days before Easter this past year, and to get out, I have to do a COVID test, test positive. And I'm just like, I have two boys at home. Like, I am not missing Easter at home with my boys. So I'm going to retest, but I have to like fix up my nose. So I lavage my nose really well with whatever I have. And then uh, if you've heard of DMSO. Oh yeah. Key later. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so don't do this please at home yeah. because not advised, not advised Yeah, for a lot of reasons, but I make a poultice of DMSO and broccoli and I just let layer my nose with it. And just like, it's this thick. And so get retested. Sure enough, I don't have COVID, but exactly. then I realized this like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just got a ton of sulforaphane straight into my blood system because this DMSO goes through the, the dermal layer. And so it's taking all this stuff. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But <laughs> I have not done it since. It was, it was like, it was an emergency. So. <laughs> hey, look, desperate times, desperate times. So desperate, desperate times, desperate, desperate measures, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So I, I forgot to ask you this earlier. We'll make it part of your art of being well. But let's just do it. But like, is there any science about premature graying of hair and sulforaphane maybe being a tool to stave that off or slow down that accelerated process? I'm assuming it's tied into these mechanisms or what, what's the science show so far? I know a little bit about that mechanism and it has to do with, I know about it from of uh, mice and when they when they make their hair, it's pretty well studied. Like, how do you have a mouse hair that has you know four different colors? You know, yeah. a guti has multiple different colors. So, as the hair is being made, there are accessory glands that are, you know, as it's growing, putting pigment into that uh, hair as it's growing out of the hair follicle. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty well known that the 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 way that hair is grayed mm-hmm. is by hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, yeah, and catalase. Excess hydrogen peroxide production. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if you wanted to try and hack that, I would, that, that's kind of how I would go about doing that. And, um, probably the best way to, uh, to, to work in that area is that manganese superoxide dismutase is, is a, a molecule that is induced by sulforaphane. It's in the mitochondria. And it's what converts your hydroxy radical into hydrogen peroxide. And then from hydrogen peroxide, it's converted back to water with catalase. So I think if if I were trying to, to get back at that system, I would say it's very likely in the mitochondria world, it's very likely hydrogen peroxide related. So combine things that would try to reduce the amount of hydrogen peroxide increase catalase. I haven't specifically looked to, to try and to try and do that. Or to that, I think uh, uh, sulforaphane would be a good good um, molecule there. And I know uh, lipoic acid is 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 in in that same pathway does reduce hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. And talking about hair, since we we are talking about it, I mean our two capsules, our one capsule even. Uh, can deliver of broccoli, can deliver a clinically significant dose. And we have actually a whole bunch of testimonials of uh, people who who have been helped with balding. So not necessarily graying, but balding. And so uh, there's a blocking of the DHT and there's that you can go to PubMed and find that sulfurifin DHT. Interestingly, 
some of our first testimonials on that, I think our first three were from older women who absolutely love us because they were thinning and they're like, I have hair. And so it's, 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 you know, it, ha- it's, it works. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you're, you're opening really in, you're inducing these pathways that are just begging to be yeah. <laughs> supported. Uh, and I have to say, like, as somebody that takes, is intentional to bring sulforaphane into my life daily, it, I noticed such, since I've started that years ago, just such a difference in my skin and my hair. I mean, people, it, we're talking about these sort of deep, wonky, like science stuff, but it's just like, it's, it could be as superficial as how you look, which isn't superficial at all. I mean, people are plagued by skin problems and hair yeah. problems, and this is something that's definitely to integrate into your life. My friends, thanks so much for taking the time and talking about all this stuff. Come back anytime. Awesome. Well, Will, this has been a delight. So really, thanks for having us on. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, helping us get the, the word out there because it's, it's weird to have a product that is, is, is as good as it is and just people not even know about it. So thank hey, you so much. For that. They're going to know about it now. And the, the, <laughs> these people that listen to the podcast are our kind of people. So they're going to love this. Thanks so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Will.